Dan. Hey. Here we are, Dan Austin at Otter Hedge Studios. Um, I thought I'd ask you a few questions about how you got into doing what you do. I had always wanted to be a producer. Or, well, I was, in, I was in a band for a long time, but I'd always been, I made a little mixing desk out of bits of cardboard and stuff when I was a kid, because I'd always liked the flashy buttons and that side of it. Um, and then I was in bands for a while, played, sort of attempted to play bass. Did you take things and, apart when you were doing Yeah, you were doing yeah, yeah I was, all, I was all about that, yeah, and yeah, like yeah. computers and techie stuff. Yeah, and, yeah. Then, and I used to borrow, when I went to secondary school, the school music department had a, a Tascam 4 track that none of the teachers knew how to use. So I used to have it most weekends and through all the summer holidays to go and record my band and my mates' bands and stuff. So got like got really into it through that. Um, and the I think the real clinching moment was when our band went to record a demo at the studio when we were like 14, we won some Battle of the Bands thing and got like two days in the studio. And I was just watching the guy doing this and I was like, fuck playing, I, like, I want to do that. I want to do this. I want to do that. Yeah, it was like, it was a real, real like, light bulb how moment. How old were you when that happened? 14, okay. when that happened. Oh wow, that's really young. Yeah, yeah. So, and I was reading like Sound on Sounds, um, various other like tech magazines. Just soaking um, it up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was just, was really into it. And then there were a few records that came out as well around that period. Like uh, Porter Says Dummy was probably my favourite record of all time, but that hearing that record and not really understanding anything about sampling, I was like, it blew my mind. I was like, I want to know how to make sounds like that or unbreak rules like that. I didn't realise that you could put white noise on a record or I hadn't really heard sub bass before and things like that. So I was just like, my, my world exploded. Right. So I was then, it was like, right, how can I, how can I do this? So I was staying in the band for a bit until I, pretty much until I started at the studio and then stopped playing because I just wanted to concentrate on that. But I got the job at, it was Miles in Bath through a random set of circumstances where I ended up meeting the studio manager on a weekend before the current head engineer left. So right. the assistant engineer, a guy called Bruno Ellingham, who's still a really close friend of mine, got promoted to head engineer. And she phoned him and said, I know you're in sixth form, but do you want to come and do like evenings and weekends? And I was like, yeah, absolutely. And then sort of school went a little bit by the way. Because I was doing even weekends then, but that was that was that I was in. You so know, seventeen years old. Seventeen doing... years old, yeah. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Brilliant. Yeah. I mean, so what's the the scene in it? Bath Malls. You've got the setup is you've got the club downstairs. Yeah. And there's a studio upstairs. Yeah, yeah. It was um, it's forty eight track tape when I started. It was like it was right up there on on the radar. Um, we had a DDA AMR twenty four when I started, and then we got an SSL, which this is a little bit of. Yeah. So yeah, so so I, I there was a, a fire at the studio um, or at the club about I don't know how long ago now, seven or eight years ago maybe, okay. um, and the studio shut at that point. I was long gone by then. I went I went freelance when I was like twenty two. Okay. But um, but that's how I so, know this board because this was the board that came in from a studio called Take One in Japan. Oh, I didn't know uh, that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was a TV studio. That's oh. why it was in, it was in such good nick when we got it. Oh. Like even the screening round here wasn't gone. Okay. Uh, you, you can always tell the TV desk is hardly any of it's used and it's just pretty much set, right? As opposed to the rock and roll ones that have got fag maybe, ash down there. Maybe just the dim buttons. Exactly, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but um, yeah, so I then, that's how I got to know SSL desks, ah, was training through right. that. And then obviously this is the bit of it that got restored that I've had the pleasure of using. Yeah, because I always thought day. it was brand new for moles, but I didn't know that. No, before. no, it was okay. brand new to Japan. Ah. And, then it, and then it came from Japan to, to, to moles. Interesting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so yeah, moles was great. There were like a lot of, really incredible producers going through there yeah so who, who, what were the kind of so you were 17 yeah and you were the the in-house engineer i was the assistant, assistant. assistant engineer there, okay. there was always a, a, a program there where there was the head engineer and the assistant engineer and then when the head engineer left the assistant would take over okay so there's con always two people around all right okay so that's um, cool and yeah. then you said from 17 through to 21 22 i 20. went i went freelance so, so, it, so to, tell us a little bit about who you work with in that period and what was well, going it was on going, and how you Learn what you learn, you know. A lot. Of, so at first, you're just running around making cups of tea and getting sandwiches, like Loads of tea. Li literally a tea. Up and down the high street, up and down the street. Up and down the high street. He wants cigarettes. He wants some McDonald's. You know, whatever the clients want. Clean the bog. Make sandwiches for everyone. 
Um, yeah, it was literally tea boy, which I think is, is a bit of an archaic phrase now, but that was it. It was right. sit at the back, make tea, watch, don't say a fucking word. Just don't, w- don't just That's w- the etiquette. Yeah, very much so, yeah. Really? Yeah, yeah, don't speak to be spoken to. It's quite, it's quite Victorian, isn't it? The yeah, sort of, totally. those, those rules. But, um, but, but you were still buzzing and into it, totally. I would have slept outside the door just to get inside the studio. Right. Like, okay. Honestly, right. I mean, it was just, I just wanted to be there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, and there were some great, great producers going there, like Paul Corkett, who I. I went on to engineer for uh, Steve Osborne, who I went to, on to engineer and mix for. Like all these guys coming through and just amazing, amazing records being made. And then also the downtime, which we rarely had, but there would be the odd few days between projects where the engineer and I, or then eventually when I was the engineer, would produce, I, don't know, I couldn't call it that back then, or you know, record local bands, or mm. we had a tap dancer in one day, or just these, yeah. these, it was an incredible experience of different types of music coming through. Yeah. It's predominantly rock music that was being recorded at the studio. Um, but we had um, an Akai S3200XL sampler, the first one in the country, uh, pre any DAWs that we had in the studio. So that became my world as well. Right. I was super quick on it. I just learned it. So that was my All job. The menus and going Everything, yeah, like that. You know, like I am on Pro Tools now, just like right. eyes closed. But it, that that got me in on a lot of sessions being right. being able to use that it was right. like a use. bit like pro tools when that came through like a couple of people were like i don't want to learn this i don't want a computer in the room and i was like i'll learn it and got really good at it on you know it's version four that i picked it up on in i think 98 when i first started seriously using it and again it was an in on the session mm. they you know i'd sit there and do all that because people didn't want to know so same with the sampler Brilliant. it was great it was great all right so so from there Age 21 or 22? 22, 22 when I went freelance, and then, yeah. So then you you were off going to do, you mentioned Linford before. Yeah, well that was, so that was a band called the Cooper Temple Clause that Paul Corkett uh, produced their first album and I engineered some of it. And at weekends when I wasn't at Moles, he was at Great Linford and he'd always been like, you should come and see a different studio because I'd only really worked in Moles. So I was very, like the live rooms in Moles were below the control room. We were just talking about the loading being horrific. It's this big old Victorian building, like four stories. So in my mind, a studio was like, yeah, you got the vocal booth through glass there, but then the band played downstairs. And his whole thing was, Matt, you need to go look at some different studios and just you know get your head around the ways that they work. So I was up there on weekends with him. But it was that band when they did their second album, asked me to go and produce it. And I was no way a producer at that point. So but how old was you when this happened? That's 22. Oh, right, 22. so it all happened... Pretty, Pretty quick, quick. Yeah, 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 yeah. So awesome. I, I jumped from the studio and it was terrifying because I, there was no way I could have gone freelance. I didn't, you know, I only had assistant or engineering credits. Yeah. Um, but, and the studio were like, you can't come back if you go, and rightly so, you know, so it was a big jump. But fortunately that record did really well and went really well. And then that was my step to getting management and picking up other bands. And it all just happened from there? Yeah. Wow. Yeah, I still get work off that record. Oh, wow. Yeah, and that, was even that now. Uh, an early version of Tools you were working on there? Or was that tape still? It was Tools. Okay. Yeah, part of the thing with what they wanted to do, part of the reason I got the gig was because we'd done uh, some demos in their rehearsal room on Logic, and they realised that they could record, obviously not to the sonic quality of a recording studio, but the freedom of being in a room with a, with a with digital audio workstation that they could do incredible things so that was we set up a, we spent the budget on a new rehearsal room uh pro tools would have been five i think the 24 track version with mm. triple eights um a, an old 12 channels of a neve desk a 51 series neve and a bit of outboard and we sat in there for a year and made the record but it was that change of technology that facilitated us to be able to do that right. and it's sonically not my best work but it it's got a vibe about it okay. and a certain naivety to it that right. I think that freedom gave us just being in their own space and having a lot of time because we weren't spending a grand a day on the studio or whatever. Right. You know, so yeah, yeah, that, that, and that, that up all these doors and yeah, 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 that was, it was a big leap. Yeah. Wow. Well, that's interesting. Yeah. I always thought you were in Cooper Temple Clause, but I didn't check that out. I wasn't. No, right. no. no. No, you just sort of, sort of, like long-term collaborator. Right. Okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. Right. When it comes to doing a session now, what are your likes and dislikes about doing residential recording? Um, do you angle for it or not? Yeah, all the time. Right, all the time. Um, if I'm with a band, I want it to be pretty much them 
and me and the assistant and to be able to work, 20, not work literally 24 hours a day, but be able to work when they want to work. Because the pressure, one thing about not being in not non-residential, and this is because I work at bands as well, is mm -hmm. like, I guess it's very different if you're doing pop sessions or solo artists or whatever, which I do occasionally, but it's normally bands who are family groups that need to be together and concentrate when they're recording because there's a million distractions. And if everyone's going off to hotels at night and traveling in and out, that's a thing that can just cause noise on the session. So you think having everyone in, you just get more done? You get more done and I think you feel more a part of it. Right. It's a, it's a personal preference for me, I guess, but it, it, I don't enjoy working in studios where I've got to travel in and out. Okay. Um, or also studios where there's lots of people around. It's like, oh, it's a very private and intimate thing, making a record with a band. And it's like, I think even staying together and eating together, yeah. all of those things, because I'm the outsider coming into their world. Mm -hmm. They're like family units. And there's suddenly some guy that's turned up who's effectively in charge of how things are going and critiquing and making judgment calls on, on their work and their, and their art. And you've got to immerse yourselves with people, I think, for them to trust you and be part. It's all, it's all part of it. Mm -hmm. The whole thing of, yeah, stay, staying in the same environment, I think, really helps that. Right, yeah, that's interesting. Um, um, what advice would you give to someone, to someone young nowadays who wants to get into... I mean, I don't even know if there's like a... Is there a, a pathway for, like you say, tea person, tea boy, um, assisting role? What, you know... Is that a thing that can happen still? Do you I think? think so? I think there's. I think there are stu there are studios that take on interns and take on assistants, and people can go. There's there's many many different routes. The, the other the, the huge thing now is that it's such an even playing field in terms of when I started at Moles, just to have access to that technology, was, a, a, it, it put me aside from other people because I was in front of their SSL desk and I could learn it, and I was in front of tape recorders and samplers. Whereas now everyone has that even on their phone. So the access to technology is now not a thing that gets, it's not a block. So that, that part of the knowledge is stuff that people should teach themselves before and can teach themselves. So the access routes now, a lot of the access routes now, I think are even working with artists, picking up someone and making a record and that becoming a success. And then people, you know, producers find their way through that path. Or there's like, yeah, to get an internship at a studio. Um, a lot of people are, doing many things like writing and producing or writing and engineering and producing so having your fingers in lots of pies and then seeing where it goes but a lot of people are coming up really quickly right. because they can learn the tech from when they're a kid um and then yeah that part of it's gone so i guess it's next the creative bit and trying to trying to find an artist or do you ever yeah. get um people sending you stuff like um aspiring engineers and people who say i've worked on this what do you reckon or can i come and can i come and hang out and see you work or not re not really stuff to critique but yeah loads of people to kind of come out i've got i've got a, a, a guy that's coming in at the moment oh, wow. um a young kid who's who's been coming in and hanging at the studio i'm all about trying to share knowledge and give people opportunities but it's very difficult like i can't bring someone on a on a session mm -hmm. that no one else knows and again it's that so. thing of not having ex extra bodies around if I'm working with someone at my studio and it, like it's been the deal with this guy, if I've got a singer down or whatever, like he doesn't come in. But I'm more than happy to have people down and sat on the sofa. I've had a lot of people ask. It's just when it's applicable. Mm -hmm. um, I'm a lot. I'm mixing a lot more now, so there's more opportunities for people to come in or whatever. And I'm. I think you learn a lot, even just sitting on a sofa, not really understanding exactly what's going on. But even like, I was talking to to this lad the other day, even about hearing like solo drums, or hearing a demo. Yeah, 99.9% .9 of people in the world never hear that. No. Do you know what I mean? So just to understand that those are the ways that records are put together is, I think, a lot of it then then starts to click yeah. later down the line. So, yeah, I, I'm all about it. It's just a shame that it's it's difficult to give people those opportunities. But whenever I can, I, I do. That's wicked, yeah. We've waffled on enough. Um, I just want to wrap this up with one last question. What is your go-to favourite piece of kit in a in a control room environment, would you say? Or in a live room? Could be anything. Sat here right now, I'm going to go for this because the desk is it's sort of my instrument on a session, I guess. Like the, all of the other stuff can, can change and be varied, but this is where I do the majority of my work, aside from the computer. But this is where I can be dead creative. 
and I've got, obviously got a little affinity with this one because it was the one I grew up on. Um, and they just look beautiful, don't they? Yeah. Lots of fun. Loads of knobs, yeah, loads of lights. Yeah, people get excited, right? Yeah, yeah, you yeah. you yeah. have one. No. <laughs> <But> <laughs> no, you've got to have one, I'm saying. Oh, right, yeah, yeah, You've, yeah. Got, to, you've yes. got to have one. Yes. A desk. Oh, no, in the studio, so I've said, do you have one? I have no. one, but it's a glorified my, uh, my mouse stand at the moment. But yeah, but it's where I can stand and turn up and get excited yeah. about it. It's, yeah. like, it's like the, it's the heart of the project. Right. You know, even whether you're using a lot of it or not. Yeah. It's like where I can sort of perform. I yeah, guess, which, pole which bit, your... like, you know, encourages a room and yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. Yeah. This. Wicked, man. Thanks very much. Thank you. Yeah. So, oh, Dan, what are you going to be doing? Okay. So we're going to be <laughs> phase aligning microphones to record guitars. Perfect. Okay. Show us how you do it. Fine. So, um, the theory is trying to get three microphones completely phase aligned which obviously is physically impossible unless you had three microphones in exactly the same position. But the idea is to get them near as damn it. And the idea of using three microphones is so I've got three microphones that are totally different. So I can use those to adjust the tone of my guitar sound. Right. So there's an SM57, which is gonna be fairly mid-rangey. There's a U87, which is gonna be fairly bright. And there's a ribbon that's gonna be fairly bassy. So I'm gonna run pink noise into the guitar cab. I'm gonna move my first microphone around to find a sweet spot. And then I'm going to put up the next mic, put it out phase and trying to find the point on the front of the cab where it cancels. I'm then going to do that for the next mic. And then by the time we pop them all back in phase, we should have beautifully phase aligned three microphones that I can then balance to tonally adjust the guitar sound that I'm recording.